Good morning, everyone, and thank you for tuning in to another episode of Coffee and Something Stronger. Happy New Year, our first episode of 2022. Um, this morning, we have on a, a good friend of Gipple and soon to be better friend of Gipple, Rabbi Ariel Root Wolpe, who is the founder and director of the Milo community, a welcoming, experiential, homegrown community that elevates individuals through transformative spiritual practices and Jewish wisdom. Um, coffee and Something Stronger is a coffee chat style interview show where we sit down with uh, practitioners, academics, spiritual leaders, and talk at the intersections of justice, climate, and faith. Rabbi Wolpe, thanks for joining us this morning. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for asking. Um, so first, to start off, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got into the work that you're doing now? Sure. So uh, I like to describe myself as a mother, musician, and rabbi in love with nature. And those are really the intersections of my um, spiritual journey and my passion. And I've always been very musical and very um, naturey, just loving to be outside. That's how I was raised, as well as being raised in the Jewish tradition. And it's really through those two um, avenues of spiritual connection and access that I decided to enter into the rabbinate. So my, um, my, I see my role as a rabbi as really um, tying those two elements into Jewish tradition and opening up what Judaism has to offer using those and other tools as well. Um, but, but those are, are definitely essential to me. That's great. Well, it sounds like a great way to live, and I'm excited to dive into some of those things this morning. I think you have a reading or perhaps a song to offer this morning to ground the space. Yes, I do. I have a song that I wrote. It's called Ruach Neshama, um, and it's a, it's a prayer for, for Earth Mother understanding uh, Jewish divinity through the earth as a feminine force and presence in the world. Um, ruach means breath, and it also means wind, and it's one of the first ways that God is described. Ruach Elohim, the, the wind or the breath of God, goes um, moves over the waters. And then that breath is what animates humans um, and gives us nishmat chai, the breath of life or the um, the soul of life. So this song is really about connecting that with that, um, that original life force that we have that is, that comes from the breath of God and the wind of God. And a reminder that every single moment we breathe, we're actually um, reaffirming that connection and that, that original source of our beingness. Dear Earth. 
Welcome. Often when I sing that in community, I then like to source um, whatever prayer or intention people are are needing in their life. And then we sing, we replace that wind or word with whatever people are in need of. So for those watching, if there's something that you um, want to call into your life right now, you can use this song as a, a prayer of invocation in a way for that. I invite everybody who's listening to participate in that practice this morning. Could you say a little bit about, you talked a bit about it before you sang the song, but the, uh, the breath of God or the wind of God and that uh, metaphor, how that relates to your own calling and journey. Yeah, sure. So um, in Jewish tradition, the name of God is unpronounceable. It's written out, yud he vav he four Hebrew letters, but we don't know how to, how to say it. Uh, but I have heard um, Rabbi Arthur Waskow teach that the way to pronounce that is actually breath, because there's uh, two he's, which is a h sound, and the other two are um, sort of fun can function as vowels or just prefix. So I love that teaching because that means that every breath we take, we're actually saying um, the name of God and that if all we really need to do is to become aware of that fact that we are, are we are breathing God in every moment um, to be in the presence, to feel the presence of God. Uh, so that that is really a, a fundamental um belief and orientation that I have towards the divine that I continuously have to practice to remind myself of that truth. Um, there's also something I, I find so much power in the, in our creation story. And there's always like, every year when we go back to rereading the beginning of the um, Torah and the new year, the Jewish new year, we, I always discover something totally new and um, they're sort of hidden in the creation stories. And there's, there's two um, explicitly in, in our text. And, and one thing that um, brings more and more meaning and depth every year is the fact that the original person, Adam, is really, the tra best translation of Adam is earthling because Adama is earth and Adam was formed from the earth itself. And that we are, you know, we are of the earth. We are, um, not only do we live in it and do we have a profound impact on it and are we assigned to be stewards and caretakers of it, but there is no, no separation between us and nature. We are part of nature. And um, a lot of my uh, spiritual, my own spiritual practice and my work in, in sort of opening up Jewish tradition is to discover different ways that we can embody that and we can be reminded of that. And that our, our text is actually at its core saying that um, and teaching us that. Yeah. Uh I love both of those so much because in a sense, it's like the, the cacophony of living beings, just being alive is to uh, name God in just a very act of living, which I think is that breath piece, which is uh, really important. And obviously being connected to the land is, is everything that we do. And so um, that's pretty important. Mm -hmm. You are um, currently working as the director of the Amalo community. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about uh, what that community is supposed to be and your intention around founding it and creating it and sustaining it. Sure. So Malo is, it's really an unfolding um, experiment. It's, it's a grassroots movement. So it's um, being formed in response to unfolding needs of the community, but it's, it's intention is, is, um, 
I guess there's a sort of like two categories of intention. One is to serve unmet needs in the community around for those that are currently um, unaffiliated or are affiliated with a community, but looking for alternative kinds of Jewish experience in some of the neighborhoods that are currently underserved in Atlanta. So in town, kind of like on the south and west side, there's not a lot going on. Um, and there's more and more Jews and people that are interested in Jewish tradition living in those neighborhoods that are looking for ways to build community and, and, and spiritual experiences that welcome diversity and welcome folks in interfaith relationships and are just generally um, very inclusive in their, their presentation. And so that's, that's a big priority for Malot is showing up, filling in that space that's, that's currently vacant. There's not, um, there's not ways, enough ways to plug in for, for those folks. And on the sort of alternative Jewish side to say like, you know what, Judaism is, um, there's like a wealth of Jewish experience inside the synagogue. And also there's a lot to uh, experience from Judaism at home and out in the world, in the community. And going on a hike on Shabbos afternoon is just as Jewish as going to Shul Shabbos morning. And getting together and singing around a fire um, on a Thursday night is just as Jewish as getting together and singing at Shul Kabbalat Shabbat on a Friday night. And so kind of like breaking down some of those um, those limiting ideas of what it means to um, be a good Jew and engage in Jewish practice. And because the reality is like, it's not one size fits all, you know, and, and that's always been true throughout history. Um, but there's always been this tension of like the, the idea of like what the right like way to be Jewish is. So you're yeah, just opening up that experience. And then because my passions are music and nature and those um, have shown to be very effective tools for engaging people that are not super comfortable in um, Jewish tradition or uh, super familiar with like, you know, prayers or text. So they're, they're easier ways to access. And they're so embedded in our tradition. Like there's so much good teachings and there's so much um, powerful ritual that is found in connecting to nature cycles and that comes through, um, through different musical modalities that are found in our tradition. So uh, it's just like raising those up and making those central to what it means to be in Jewish, a Jewish experience. Yeah, what is it like linking? I mean, I think in particular the idea of gathering around a fire and singing songs is a is a really good uh, core thing that links people. I think especially in the South, and so as mm -hmm. you uh, are bridging that sort of like religious experience with the outdoors, um, you know, why is that important? And maybe what uh, to what extent do you find that that impacts a religious community to the extent that they're connected with their surroundings or with their uh, natural habitat? Oh my God, there's so many ways I could answer this question. Um, there's so many different directions. So, I mean, we're from the earth and there is a disconnection in the way that we live our lives. You know, like I am acutely aware that I am inside of a building talking to you right now and not out in nature. No, I do right. not take this. I do not like, this is no longer my, my default. Um, like that this is the way that I would, I would or should, or is like ideal for me to live. There, there is something so nourishing about being out in nature. And that's why so many people seek that, you know, on, in their recreational time, they'll go on hikes or go camping or all of that. Um, there's just something rejuvenating, like it's almost like if I, it's almost like I don't have to do all of the work myself when I bring people out into, um, especially in the wilderness, but even just like outdoor anywhere. It's like all of creation is 
is talking to us and helping us connect, you know, sort of like, I almost feel like whispering like little um, messages and prayers in our ear, you know, however we experience that, um, whether it's like a whisper of the wind on your, on your skin, or you see a bird fly over, all of those are nourishing for the soul. And they're actually um, like physically nourishing, like for our nervous system, they're relaxing. So I think, you know, especially during this time, but in any like industrial capitalist society, like we need like intense nervous system decompression experiences and nature offers that um, and music too. Yeah. And, and be because of like the way that we live our lives, you know, we're in a, <laughs> we're in a climate crisis and it is, any any religious or spiritual community that cares about humankind and cares about creation needs to be investing in connection with nature because the more we feel connected to anything the more we care for it the more we feel in relationship with nature with god with our family with strangers you know the more the more time and energy and care we invest in taking care of that so so fostering a relationship with the environment is part of creating a generation of people that can be stewards, proper stewards of the environment, which is our, is our initial, one of our initial tasks as humans in the world is to care for it. Um, yeah, I'll stop there, but those are, those are two things that, that come to mind. Yeah, no, those are, those are really great. Um, Oftentimes we talk about, you know, we care about the climate, we care about the environment, we care about it, each other because there are spiritual tenants that call us to do that um, and making change in the world, making a more just world. And yet just doing the little things to remind ourselves that we are connected to creation, whether that is planting a tree or doing individual recycling in your home, there is a there's a practical impact to it, but there's also spiritual discipline that helps to remind us that we are in this world called to take care of it. And so are there ways in which you in your own life or in your community um, recommend that people implement these spiritual practices so that they can remind themselves that they are connected to the land and connected to community um, in, in pretty meaningful ways that are, as you said, uh, constantly ripped apart by just the structure of society that we live in, or at least covered up to the extent that we aren't paying attention to them as much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the first thing that comes to mind is um, there's a, there's a, I could call it an initiative or a concept called eco kosher. So keeping kosher is a Jewish, it's, it is, when you say like, spiritual discipline, like I think a lot of people, uh, a lot of Jews would think of keeping kosher because that's mm -hmm. like a daily discipline of eating that um, eliminates certain foods and uh, keeps food separate and uh, requires a lot of intention. Um, you know, in addition to saying blessings for the food you're about to eat and bringing that sort of intention and that discipline of pausing before consuming something to appreciate where it came from. Um, so actually, you know, blessings are kind of the, the like, the basic level of that, which is, you know, we're, everything that we have came from the earth. And when we pause and bless something and bless the, the source of life or bringing this into our lives, we expand our awareness for a moment um, beyond just like, you know, my pleasure, my experience, my consumption of this um, food or experience or whatever it is to, you know, appreciating the, the series of things that brought it to the table. Um, but I think more specifically, so, so kashrut has been kind of this, this food discipline throughout Jewish history, um, and it's gained this reputation in kind of like a, um, you know, justice and environmental conscious, um, 
like Western civilization world of being like a healthy thing or something that's that's ethical. Um, and in some ways there are, there are some ethical pieces of kosher, like you don't cook a calf in its mother's milk, like that's clearly like to instill a sense of um, uh, care and respect for the relationship of an animal with its young. Mm. Um, but the, the process and the like industry of kosher is not actually like necessarily ethical or environmental in the in modern times the way we look at it so there's this initiative now to practice instead of kosher practice eco kosher and eco kosher is um looking at the ecological impact of your eating and that that is just as basically like at the same level of the you have the same level of discipline around making those choices as you do around kosher so things like um you know, locally buying locally sourced foods and um, composting your food and um, reducing your meat or eliminating your meat are all parts of a, a evolving Jewish conversation around, you know, our dietary needs. Um, and it's not surprising that that is happening because like diet is a huge part of Jewish, <laughs> Jewish culture and identity and what foods you eat at this meal and, um, and kind of a way of like, uh, separating ourselves. Like there's a lot of people I know, the only thing they do is they don't eat bacon. You know, that's like their like Jewish identity is they, they don't eat a certain thing. So, so that's something that I've been, you know, personally exploring and talking a lot about. And there is kind of a, I think maybe, Part of it is a Southern culture thing of um, like homesteading. And, you know, some people come from actually farming backgrounds in rural areas around Atlanta and other places in the South. And so there's already this sense of like how to, um, more of a sense of like growing your own food and even like raising like small lives, livestock to support your family and I think I think Judaism like can really lean lean into that um, and support that and and support people in making kind of ecological dietary choices as part of that larger framework of kosher and intentionality around eating. Yeah, thanks so much for that. Um, it's we are coming up on the time of Tuvishva, which I thought you might could tell us a little bit about, and then um, we've got some tree planting events this coming weekend and the weekend after, which I'll talk a little bit about after you, but um, yeah, what's the two-inch fought? Why does it matter? Um, how should people be thinking about this coming weekend? Yeah. So Tubish Shvat is the 15th day of the month of Shvat, and it's considered the birthday of the trees. So it's a holiday for connecting with nature and specifically with these beings, these, um, these tree beings, which provide habitat and food and, um, you know, and is, is plays this essential role in our origin story. You know, our relationship with trees is mythical and powerful and, um, and we are, we have cut down, I don't know, you probably could tell me what percentage of, um, <laughs> too many, you know, I don't know rainforest but too many. <laughs> tree habitat we've destroyed. I mean, everyone knows that trees need our, uh, need to be invested in. So Tubishvat is a day for planting trees and honoring our relationship with trees and, and sharing stories of planting trees. Um, there's a beautiful, a story of um, in the Talmud of um, a young boy who is walking along the road and sees an older, um, well, I'll say woman, planting a tree, planting a carob tree. And he stops and he's like, what are you doing? And she's like, oh, I'm planting a carob tree. And he says, well, you know, that a carob tree takes 70 years to bear fruit. So why are you bothering? You know, you're an old woman. You're not going to be around for 
to receive the benefits of your labor. And she looks around and he looks around and sees all these care of trees. And she said, you know, the people before me planted these trees so that I could, I could benefit from them. And so likewise, I am planting this tree for the coming generations. And that kind of um, mentality is tied into this holiday. It's like, it's an, also an investment in the generations to come. We say la door of a door from generation to generation that when we plant a tree, it's not for our own benefit. It's, it's intentionally for those mm. who are coming after us. Yeah, that's awesome. I uh, love that perspective. I think especially in a culture in which we think about how to consume in the right now, I think it's really helpful to have like a generational perspective. Um, yeah, so for those of you who are listening, we are partnering with Repair the World for two inch spot tree planting this coming Monday on the MLK Day. And then the weekend following, we're doing another tree planting um, just with Gipple. You can go to our website at gipple.org um, and click on events, or there'll be a link in the description of this video. But if you want to get out in the world and plant some trees and get connected to the world early in the year, I think this is a good opportunity to do that. Um, we heard as you started, uh, Rabbi Wolpe, your uh, creative songwriting. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about sort of the intersections of creativity, of song with justice and sort of this uh, calling to connect with creation. Do you have? Yeah. Um, well, songs have always been part of justice movements, and that's not a coincidence. Music is, um, has the power to open our hearts in ways that they are closed, to open up blockages so that we can move through emotions and not get stuck and, and provide healing in that way. And any, any justice movement that is pushing up against uh, the status quo and trying to progress society is 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 painful um, and requires both um, music to to help motivate and to energize and also music to heal and to recover from the intense work of that um, of that work. So um, you know, I I see my music as my own my sort of inner teachings that are not, that are not, can't just be articulated with words. It needs, they need melody to be communicated. Um, and there are some songs that I feel like I sort of wrote, but sort of, sort of received that, that I don't feel like I can take complete ownership of, um, that I, uh, felt like I was tuned into something greater than myself and, and was more of a channel for those songs. And so no matter what my intention for the, the music is, it, once it's out there, it's kind of, it's released. And I've had the honor of seeing my songs used in many different ways uh, for different purposes, all in the name of healing and justice and building community. Um, so that's a huge gift for me that that is also like a collaborative process with others that are um, that are doing important work um, in the world. But I think that that where my where I find the most meaning from, I think where what I'm the best at is using music to connect people um, with themselves and with nature and helping us kind of shed some of the burden and the walls that we put up um, just to get through our daily lives and to feel more deeply what it is that's going on inside of us and be held by a container, a musical container, which speaks beyond words. I mean, anyone that has experienced music knows that there's something that happens um, at you know a melodic swell or when the harmonies come in that just kind of like can open us up and can help us tap into those feelings and it's really 
we need to have access to those in order to make change in the world and in ourselves. You know, like when I look around and I see, um, you know, what you might think of as, as evil in the world, it, it, I actually see it just as people that are like shut down mm -hmm. and they've had to like close off a part of themselves. And so that, that's how they're able to do, to behave like that and to not care for other people and to really look the other way when there's, when they're causing suffering. Um, and, you know, some of those people will be able to like open the door and some, and some never will do that, or at least not in this lifetime. Um, but for those that are, um, that are open or that are open to the possibility, I see that music and, and different, and also different, uh, forms of spiritual ritual that can be really present with what's happening in the current moment and can respond in real time to the needs of the people there, um, instead of kind of presenting like some, like, like routine but is like alive in the moment that the possibilities are expansive and endless for transformation um and so that's really my 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 passion is to first of all in, increase my skill at doing that because it's always you know it's an it's an ongoing um evolution of being able to be tuned into what's actually going on in a moment and aware of how other people are experiencing something, but, but also to, to not stop and just keep trying, keep doing it and keep offering it and support others that are trying to do similar work, um, in, and collaborating together and creating a community that is invested in that. Yeah, that's so powerful. Thank you so much for coming on the show this morning. Uh, I'll just add for people who are watching, you can see in the description for this video, both a link to Rabbi Wolpe's website and also uh, her album that is out. If you want to purchase that and continue to uh, bask in some of these songs. I, I just wanted to ask you one final question before we leave. You know, I'm struck by so much of the things that you were talking about, about building in these rhythms of sort of being in contact with creation and getting out and thinking about tree plantings and all those things kind of just remind me that the call of creation or to connect with creation is really a matter of becoming more alive. The more connected we are with the creative world, the more alive we become, the more um, in touch we are with our own breath, the more that we're reminded that we are uh, living into God and God is living into us as we exist on the planet. And so I wonder for you, how have you found the process of connecting with creation, a avenue for you to become more alive? And what would you say to people who are listening to or watching this show at the beginning of the year who are thinking maybe I too might connect with creation to become more alive? Mm. Well, I think a great day to, to do that um, especially if it's something you're trying to invest more in is to do it on your Sabbath, whatever, whichever mm -hmm. day that is. So for Shabbat, you know, the, the world was created in six days and on the seventh day we rested. Um, and so it's doing, 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 doing capitalism for six days, <laughs> <laughs> creating, manipulating, changing, um, producing carbon. And then the seventh day is resting it's tuning into what is, it's resisting, uh, exerting human control over the environment, but instead witnessing and connecting um, in, in Martin Buber's language, stepping into an I-thou relationship where you're really beholding another being, not as a means to, en to an end, but as um, a soul within itself. And so, and that's also part of what Malo is is trying to offer is different ways of stepping into Shabbat so that it is opening and is connecting and is meaningful for different people, depending on what their flavor is. Um, so, you know, taking a day to like put your computer away and um, maybe if you live in a good place, maybe not try not even to drive and just be present in the environment that is around you. And, you know, we know that you, you already live in nature. 
Like you step outside of your house, there is nature there. If you, um, if you want to try something new, find a spot near your house or your apartment or wherever you live that there's a spot for you to just sit and make that your sit spot. And at the same time, every day, go and sit there for five, 10 minutes with your you know, cup of coffee or whatever as a break and just see what animals, what beings um, walk down the path that time of day. And you actually get to know your neighbors, your animal neighbors that live next to your house that you had no idea were even there. You know, investing in the nature, a nature relationship in the place that you live is totally transformational to know that you don't actually have to drive like a half an hour to go to um, Arabian Mountain or whatever, some beautiful right. nature place to be in nature. You already live in nature. So yeah, and exploring a uh, Shabbat practice and, um, and, ex and accepting and, and breathing into the place that you already are is um, a profoundly transformational experience. Thank you so much. Yeah, perhaps a challenge to everybody here, uh, find a sit spot and begin spending some time and some place in nature to build that connection because the more that we love a place and are connected to a place, the more that we can do to save a place. So um, let's do that. Mm -hmm. Rabbi Wolfie, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you for being our first guest of 2022. <laughs> My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. Thank you all for tuning in and we'll see you in two weeks.